Prof, what an absolute pleasure to have you here. Um, we've had a blast just before everybody joined us on the call. Uh, I think this is going to be an exciting one. Uh, the numbers have just uh, climbed up. We've got a whole lot of people joining us. And I think this is one of the most, um, one of those anticipated talks because you're just so fabulous, you know. Um, so without any waste of time, let me tell you guys a little bit about Prof. Uh, Prof Eugene uh, John Moore. Uh, was born in and raised in Zimbabwe. He graduated with a PhD from UKZN, Peter Marisbeck. He holds an honorary appointment as an extraordinary professor in the Department of Biodiversity and Conservation Biology at UWC. Prof held the foundation chair in natural systems management in the Department and Management Studies at the University of Queensland, Australia moving from UCT, where he was professor and head of the Department of Botany. He has received a number of awards, including Wildlife and Environment Society of South Africa, uh, South Africa's gold medal in 1998, as well as being elected an honorary life member of the Botanical Society of South Africa uh, from 2013. He has published <laughs> somewhat 221 peer-reviewed papers, 20 books, and more than 150 articles. In addition, he has supervised some 35 master students and 23 PhD students. In fact, let me just stop there because of Prof just doesn't stop. In fact, he's currently uh, working on a, on a book. I don't know if I can share those details. Prof, uh, let me keep yeah. quiet to tell them all about it. So, uh, Prof, I don't know where you get the energy and how you keep going. Um, you look like a sweet 16. I don't know, maybe you should share some of the secrets uh, of botany that makes you look so good. So without any waste of time, ladies and gentlemen, remember to drop us all the questions that you might want to ask Prof at the end, uh, pop them on the chat on the Q&A, and we'll get them, uh, we'll get Prof to assist us with some answers. Uh, from my side, I'll see everybody on the other side, and Prof, the floor is all yours. Well, well, John, thank you very much for that. Um, as ever, you give far too glowing reports. I've just been very lucky to have been in the right place at the right time. I view my life as, as though I've never worked, um, but I've been paid for doing and pursuing my love of, of plants, particularly plant ecology and gladly trees. So um, we're working on two books at the moment, trees, to, trees of Kruger Park and just a new project as I needed it, um, the trees of the Waterberg, because there's a wonderful wildflower guide coming out very soon on the wildflowers of the Waterberg, and that's an excellent team. But let's get to the task in hand. This is the first webinar presentation that I've ever made, so I'm, I'm feeling a wee bit nervous, I guess, even though I might be 80 and, and have done this many times, but still talking to people you can't see is, is a bit daunting. Um, and I've adjusted my style a little bit to meet the requirements, I hope, of both amateurs and professionals. Um, and because the presentation will be made live, will be, you'll be able to get it after this. Um, everyone will be able to log in at, an, at another stage. So let me get on with, with it. The title is Fainbrus a Unique Cape Heathland. And it's really a tribute to Ray Speck, who um 1924 2021 and you may ask you know why am i paying ray a tribute and here's a picture of ray in in october um 1979 that's ray specked here talking to hans van dalen and um gosh here we go mike cameron in a fainbus island um it's what's interesting about fainbus islands is that I don't know that we thoroughly understand their, their origin and their permanency. Um, it, it's been put down to fire, but it may also be down to nutrients. So that's a question which I hope I'll address a bit later on. And if I don't, I'm sure someone will remind me. So Ray was key to my, to my life because in 1978, I got a postdoc to work with him in the University of Queensland. And in that year, I traveled oh, 25,000 kilometers with my wife and two, two small kids, and often in temperatures of 50 degrees. 
going to all the Heathland sites that Ray marked on a map for me, from as far north as Cairns, down south to um, Melbourne and Adelaide, and inland as far as the as Uluru or Ayers Rock. And then on my way home, I spent three weeks in Western Australia looking at sites in Western Australia. So I spent the year really looking at Australian heathlands. Um, and I got an understanding about what Ray's concept of a heathland was through that journey. And, um, and I think that and then I came back, I learned more about South African heathlands in Australia than I'd learned when I'd been here in South Africa. So it's Ray's has about 220 odd refereed publications, much more erudite than mine, I can tell you. Um, but the important ones for me are three books that he did. Um, perhaps the most important for this talk anyway is in 1979, he, he edited these two volumes, 9A and 9B in Heathlands of the World. And in that there were chapters by Fred Kruger from Yonkers Hook on the South African Heathlands and Don Killick, who unfortunately now has passed on from Pretoria and Sandby about the African mountain heathlands. So, um, and then later on in 81, he edited a book on Mediterranean ecosystems of the world. And just to show that he was a great botanist too, in 72, he published a book on the vegetation of South Australia. Now, South Australia is almost the size of South Africa. So pretty daunting. He's a he was a formidable character, exceptionally kind and nice with a wonderful wife, Marion. Um, and, and they had one daughter called Alison, who's kind of following in her father's footsteps. Um, so we, in those days, we, a whole bunch of us from the Mediterranean climate zone areas of the world, which are, of course, in, in Australia, mainly around Adelaide, Melbourne, even Sydney is kind of all year rainfall across to Perth and then South Africa, of course, in the Cape, um, the Chileans from San Diego, the Californians from Southern California, Los Angeles down to San Diego, and of course, the Mediterranean Basin. We had a group that met um, almost consistently. They still meet every three or four or five years um, at a venue somewhere. And um, the good thing about it is that we all bring a bottle of red wine to these meetings. And that's a nice icebreaker. So we drink each other's wine and we taste it blind and we vote who's the best wine. And I must say that South Africa has won many of the prizes. When I was young, like Fred Kruger in the middle here in this, in this picture at a meeting that was in the Portuguese Matarol organized by Fernanda Catarina, who's on, on my left and Ray Specht is, is on the extreme left. So Ray Specht, Fernando, Fred, Marguerite Ariansu from Greece and Phil Rundell from UCLA. So those were some of the major players and still certainly Phil Rundell is still publishing vigorously. Unfortunately, Fred has died and Ray has died. Um, Margarita, I think, um, I'm not sure what she's doing or Fernando, I've lost track of them, but yeah. So the, the important thing really about Heathlands that I learned from Ray is that they are, is that they're a vegetation type that is the only globally mappable vegetation type that does not or is not determined by climate. We all know tropical rainforests, you expect them in the Amazon, in the Congo Basin, across through Indonesia, um, and deserts you expect where there's no rainfall. But heathlands occur where there are minimum amounts of phosphorus in the soil. So on these on these three and these three maps shown there's they're all roughly the same scale so the usa on the extreme left you can see it's got a lot of black and a lot of dark shading and that the black is the most phosphorus available and white is minimum phosphorus available so if you compare the us to australia you see that australia is mainly phosphorus de deficient or deficient or poor Deficiency I don't like because deficiency intimates that plants exhibit some kind of um, sign of a deficiency. So if there's an iron deficiency, you might plants may be chlorotic, but um, Heston plants are able to adapt to these extremely low one part per million of 
plant available phosphorus. It's plant available phosphorus that's the key, not the total phosphorus, because much of the phosphorus can be locked up and unavailable. And if you look at Africa, Africa is somewhat in between. So if you, um, if I get my, so Africa is somewhat in between. Um, and you can see that down here in the Southwestern Cape where we are, it's a very, very phosphorus, very poor in, in phosphorus in the soils. So let me catch my breath here a little bit and go to the next slide. And what has baffled me through my life is why is there's no, why do we continue to confuse the state of heathland interpretation um, in, in the world, particularly in South Africa um, and, and, and particularly in the Southern Hemisphere. So there must be some kind of reason for that. So when I scan the global literature, um, it, it's generally accepted that heathlands are low, mostly ericaceous dominated, dominated shrubland. And that's a very Eurocentric or European interpretation. So the, the Scottish heathers, the German Heidefeld and, and the Irish heathlands too, they, these in fact are actually largely areas that result from human degradation over the last couple of thousand years. Um, the heathers were always there in the understory, but when the trees and, and plants, other bigger plants were removed and the, and the vegetation was continually burnt, um, the heathlands started to dominate. And for me, one of the things that when I look at as a plant ecologist, when I see almost monospecific stands of any plant, then to me, that means there's been radical disturbance. I'm actually looking at what I call a weedscape. So if you go to Scotland, uh, the Highlands of Scotland, where's Coluna vulgaris, I think it might be Erica vulgaris. Now I'm not sure of their taxonomy, but that's not important. That's almost a monospecific stand. And that to me tells me that it's, it's been hugely disturbed at some stage. And you know, when we disturb systems in nature, they don't always bounce back very quickly. Um, and that's a problem for us today and, and into the future. But that's for another story. So the other thing is that ecology also has its roots in, in Europe. And it still, and it still characterizes the science. Although the Southern Hemisphere, um, there's some challenges um, that I'm trying to get rid of these. I can't get rid of these. OK. Um, characterize, although the Southern Hemisphere, they're challenging. So again, it's another European paradigm. And, and our own ecologists tend to go for sabbaticals into the Northern Hemisphere, to the States or to Europe or to Germany. Um, and they, they reinforce that European view of ecology. And I think that that's a problem, um, that we really have never developed a proper Austral or a Southern Hemisphere interpretation of ecology and certainly of Heathland. So when Speck wrote his, or edited that, that those two volumes and, and something of, critical importance here is that these volumes are not available on the net. If you, today, most people who do research don't go to libraries anymore. They research on the net. And so if information is not available on the net, then they don't read it. And there's an example of this that I'll tell you about a little bit later on. And so his, this huge body of research that he's done largely gets ignored or is not known. And so we still cling on to our European paradigms. And if, if you don't believe that's so, you know, to me, the one thing I'm not sure, um, Africanization or of, of many things in South Africa are, are, are critically important, but certainly ecology. We don't have an, a Southern Hemisphere ecological approach. We've learned from the West and we still have it. So the IUCN charters still hold sway um, in, in South Africa. And so my view is that most South Africans have fallen into this European trap. Um, so if we, if we then think, okay, now I've talked about this. So what is it? What is a heathland? What exactly is a heathland? Well, heathlands are evergreen communities. Soils generally less than one part per million of plant available phosphorus. So they're evergreen and they are low in plant available phosphorus. And they grow on soils, mainly quartzitic sands 
or calcareous or laterite planes, and on humic pod soils. Those are the kinds of soils that have low in nutrients. They're often dominated by woody plants in the overstory, shrubs of, of some form or another, um, but they can have a, a bigger herbaceous um, content as well. Um, but often that herbaceous content, it's very seldom purely herbaceous. It's usually mixed with some kind of woody component. They're not climatically determined. And this is, this is in essence very critical because when we come to our own South African map by Messina and Rutherford, that big tome, Vegetation of South Africa, et cetera, um, it's based on biomes and biomes are really about climate and plant form and, and function. Plant nutrient availability is not taken into consideration in the biome concept. And I'll get a bit more to that as well. A key ecological driver of Heathland is fire. And I think we all know that. I don't think that that's contestable, to be honest. Um, the morphological ad adaptions that Heathland plants show is sterophily, which is exceptionally hard leaves. They're very, very hard and tough. They can be small or they can be quite large. Um, they tend to be functionally bilaterally in terms of their photosynthetic surface. Now, that's, that's a big word. I say bilateral means that both sides. So if you have a protea leaf, it's got palisade tissue, if you remember any botany you ever did, which is that very hard columnar structural cell structure, both top and bottom. Um, so they are very hard, these leaves, and they have many different post-fire regeneration strategies. Um, so mimicacori is one of the things, oh, that's better. Sorry, I've just improved this view on my screen. Um, Post-generation strategies such as mimicacori, which means antispersal, and serotony, which means that the, the fruits of a woody plant are held on that plant until the plant is burned. And, then, and only then do the capsules or the, the fruiting bodies open to release seed. So there's some, it's not that they're not mimicacorous plants elsewhere. There are some in, in forests and woodlands, but the vast majority are in heathland by, by far. Um, and that was unknown until of that, that seminal work by Slingsby and Bond. It was published in Felton Flora, I think, some, I don't know, 30, 40 years ago. Um, and thereafter, it's become much, was much better known. And what's key to me is, and something I didn't know before 1978 when I visited Australia and did all those, those plots and miles and miles and miles of nothingness, is that it's in Australia where most heathlands occur with the largest variety of structural forms. And they occur from Cape York in the very far north, which is about six degrees south, to southern Tasmania, um, which is way south of us, from the east coast to the top of Mount Kosciuszko, which is the highest mountain on the Great Dividing Range in, in Australia, through the arid centre to Western Australia. And next in terms of the largest area and structurally different types is Africa. And in South Africa, we have large amounts of heathland in the Cape Floristic region, but also in the Drakensberg, in Ponda land, in Tonga land, and various other places as well. So they're not confined, heathlands are not confined to the Mediterranean climate zone, which is still something which people in this country and others from other Mediterranean climates keep publishing stuff about our so-called Feinbos being a Mediterranean type shrubland, which to me is not correct. Finally, there are ancient communities with evidence going back to the Permian, so back as much as 250 million years, and hence their species richness. I mean, something we've just learned recently in the last 10 years or 15 years or so, and work by Bond and others, that our grasslands are much older than our Afromontane forests or our forests because of the much greater plant diversity. So. And heathlands have even a greater diversity. So to me, they've, they're older. And Ray covers this in, in his book. So having said all of that, I'm sure that people are wondering why, um, where heathlands begin and grasslands and savannas end or begin. So if you think of a gray scale from black to white, and on the black side, you have pure heathlands, which is the typical ericaceous stuff that we see in Scotland, for example. And on the and white is is pure grassland. If you look at the underlying processes beneath that line, um, it's on a nutrient gradient um, focus. So, 
in Ray's interpretation, he has a very broad view of heathlands and, and, and that many people, and I think that's what's put a lot of people, made a lot of people not understand what he wants because they haven't really looked at the, the range of heathland types that I looked at in, in Australia. I mean, I've visited about 150 different sites um, from the north to the south, to the east, to the west. And, 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 and Ray's um, view of heathlands is, is very liberal. Um, so he, if he was applying this information in South Africa, he would include um, parts of the Mambo woodlands where Protea and Faria can be in the understory. That would be one of that, he would call that a heathland. And so the Protea savannas in the Drakensberg, for example, and the Highfield grasslands being invaded by Bunkrock boss, those would all be heathlands or on their way to becoming heathlands. So he had this very liberal view, not the narrow view of the Europeans. So I've tried to encapsulate that in a, in a gradient below, and I'm going to take a little bit of time to explain this, because to me, this is quite critical. So here we have soil surface, and here's our white grassland going to our black, the conventional European heathlands. So the grasslands are dominated clearly by grass, and the heathlands are dominated by mainly shrubs, these blocky things, and these upside down triangles are graminoids, and those graminoids for us could be restios, sedges, and even some grasses. So that's at the one extreme. And then down below, the nutrient gradient from high phosphorus availability, plant availability, down to low availability. So you can see that, that grassland, as you go down the, the nutrient gradient, grassland starts having shrubs and trees in it. Um, and then trees and shrubs with a heathland understory, and then conventional European heathland. So those are four neat little blocks, just for argument's sake. Now, Ray Speck, this is what he, that's where his heathlands end. His heathlands end with, end where you have grassland with trees and shrubs and the occasional, what he calls a heath species, like a faria or a protea for that matter, um, or certain sedges and grasses and even the adrestio. And then, you have trees and shrubs with the heath and understory and then con to conventional heath. So that's, that's what Ray's interpretation is. Now that's a very wide interpretation. And I mean, we can argue about where you draw the lines between one type and another, but that's an argument for a, a different kind of an argument. The argument here is that he defined them as low phosphorus and not climatically determined. And here you can see these are two very poor examples. I'm sorry for that, but the best I could get off the web. Um, these are just two examples of Europe, classic European heathlands. And then I've taken this picture of a heathland near Sydney. And in the foreground here, there are, there are a Pacridaceae, which are in the Ericaceae now, and there are Restios. Here's a Banksia, which is a Protea. So this, is, this has got Restios, Ericas, and Proteas, which is a typical Cape heathland in many respects. Um, and then behind, these are eucalypts as an understory. The same vegetation here runs in under as a, under this overstory of eucalyptus species, because here the soils are shallow, and when the soils get deeper, the eucalypts can, can grow and dominate. So in Australia, the unique thing is that many of their heathlands have a tree overstory, which we don't have in the Cape, and that's a, also another interesting topic. Classically, these are what we know as heathlands or mountain, what we'd call mountain famous, what I would prefer to call um, a mountain, Cape Mountain heathland famous, um, because to put them into a global re recognized category, we should call them heathlands because that's, that's what they are generically globally. As the birders have done, they've, they've, they've got a standardized list of bird names now for the whole, for the whole planet. So if you're an American and you, you, you see a spur file in South Africa, you know, because you know what it is because you have them in, in the States. That's why many of our Franklin species went to spur file because of those, those relationships, those phylogenetic relationships. So here we have a classic Cape Heathland with, with um, here it happens to be a leucodendron, they're, they're restionaceae in here as well as ericaceae and, and many other species. So that's, that's, and it's on quartzitic. You can see a bit of a quartzitic rock at that far, on that far side. 
So then I, I, I got some photo, better photographs from Manning's book. You know, John Manning's written this lovely book on, on Fainbus, so available from Strack Nature. And so here, three examples of, of restios, which are common. Um, the one in the middle is, is Elegia, and it's common on wet sites. Um, we have, I think, six or 700 species of Erica alone in this, in this Cape Floristic region, which is their center of endemism. Um, and then, of course, we have the Protea overstory. And these Proteas, of course, Protea, there's several genera, they're Leucodendrons, Leucospermums, and others as well. And if you go back to the Ericas, they, this ericoid leaf form is also present in many other families, um, in the legumes, for example, in the phylicas, and, and many other um, genera. So if we look at the global distribution of Restionaceae, Proteaceae and Ericaceae. Um, I've done this just to show that Restios have a southern hemisphere, Gondwana. They have a Gondwana distribution. A large number in, the, in, in southern Africa, but an enormous number in Australia, and a few scattered in South America, and then there are a few outliers that have presumably over geological time been able to get into the northern hemisphere into Eurasia. Protea is, the Proteaceae are much the same, or well, they are much more widely spread. Um, they, their, their nutrient requirements are not, they're able to survive in slightly, and survive, and when I say survive, compete with other plant species, I think that's critical. They can compete with other plant species in slightly richer um, phosphorus soils. And you can see that Proteaceae essentially is also an old Gondwana um, distributed family. But when it comes to Ericaceae, Ericaceae, as you can see, it's really Eurasian. It's mainly in, the, in Europe, but those are things like, um, now I've got to rack my brains, azaleas and rhododendrons and those kinds of things. Um, but there are lots in the Southern Hemisphere and, and Erica, Erica, especially in, the, in the, the genus Erica in the Cape and the Epacridaceae um, in Australia were very big and they've recently been sunk um, into the Ericaceae. So a large number of Ericas and you can see the Australian distribution of Erica is very wide. And that to me mimics or follows the, the heathland, um, the heathlands of, of Australia. So coming back to what Ray's interpretation would be, this is at Maripskop. This is a, um, the top of Maripskop, which is the northern end of the Drakensberg, which is our longest mountain range in South Africa. And this is Protea Kafra savanna, and he would have called this a heathland. So we don't call that a heathland, but I'm just saying what his interpretation would be. Um, and it's worth considering this, and I'll come to that in a moment. Here in Golden Gate National Park, again, um, below the cave sandstones here are Acacia Kafra woodlands, which he would, he would consider to be a heathland. And here are the Blader River. This is a Faria saligna, I think, and there's Proteas and Farias in the background. Uh, Faria making quite a substantial tree in this particular case. And being um, a heath, he would also classify this as a heathland. And then, because many of my critics, when I talk about this, say, well, you know, there's no rest here. So here's a case in point where there's, um, and I've just got to find my, my little notes here because I've forgotten its name. Um, this is, I beg your pardon for a moment here, sorry folks. Um, I've got so much damn paper here that, that I've, I've got lost amongst it. Um, right, so that is, this is Restia shinoides um, here in the top of Marie Scorp in a, in a swampy area together with the Miscanthidium grassland. So this is a half Restia dominated community and unfortunately, I don't have a slide because it's no longer able to take one, but the Vasi swamps in Maputa land, just north of, of Lake Sabai, um, that were drained by the forestry department 60, 70 years ago to plant pines and eucalypts. That was that area, either an area of over 100 hectares, was all Restia zuluensis, um, a complete, almost 100% monospecific stand in that, in that swamp. So Restias are not confined to the Western Cape, and there, so there are by anyone's definition, there is Fainbus outside of the Western Cape. Um, but critically for me, um, sorry, I'm trying to get rid of this, uh, is that we still largely ignore what's going on um, here in South Africa. 
Um, and what was interesting to me is that back in some years ago, I was asked to review a paper by um, Berg et al. Um, in a chapter in a book edited by also and company called Famous Ecology, Evolution and Conservation of a Mega Diverse Region, Oxford University Press. Um, and the chapter one was Vegetation Types of the Greater Cape Floristic Region, which I was asked to review. Um, and this was in 2014. And I was quite, quite nervous about this review because I, I knew that I would be a bit critical of, of what they'd done. But to my great relief, when I looked at the ordination of the genera from the data from the, from the greater Cape, Cape Floristic region, I'm trying to get my, um, oh, there it is. Um, there we are. Greater Cape Floristic region, you can see they looked at the genera. I've, they've taken out the Afromontane forests because those are such outliers. I mean, they're so different from anything else. They're not shrublands anyway. And they are a relic of a, of a previous, more wider, widely dispersed vegetation type. But if you look at their, their fainbus, their fainbus, these are the fainbus genera. And then these are the Renostafelt genera. These are the subtropical thicket, or what ACOX called Strunfelt, which I prefer that name to be quite frank, but then maybe I'm a bit old fashioned. And then the succulent Karoo. So you can see that fainbus graze through into Rhinosterfeld, and that graze the Rhinosterfeld elements in subtropical thicket and subtropical thicket elements in Rhinosterfeld, and succulent crew, succulent crew, and vice versa. So you can see there's a gradient, and I would, if they'd done the nutrients, you would see from very nutrient poor to more nutrient rich, um, and nutrient richer up there and down there. So, so at the generic level, they showed that there, that, that the famous that we call what we call famous is in fact um, a recognizable recognizable special form called heathland and not to be dumped as many people do together with Rhinosterfelt um, into a Mediterranean type shrubland. So I think that, that that confusion still reigns and in a recent publication, in fact, I had an altercation with Phil Rundell a couple of years ago when he was here with a group from UCLA and said, come on, Phil, how do you, you know, we were in Cape Point. I said, look at this. This is not Mediterranean. This is a heathland. But, you know, being, a, being a, um, from the US, where there are very few heathlands at all, he didn't recognize it. And, and, and to me, his mind was closed on that particular issue. And I think my critics might say my mind's closed on the heathland issue. But so be it. I think you've got to look at the facts that you can get from the literature. Um, so where am I? So that, so Berg et al. produced this, this map and they, they did change some of the, the, some of the words in their chapter, but to this day that their conclusions haven't somehow been incorporated. So this was work done in 2014, which is seven years ago now. Um, we still seem to be ignoring those results. So why then should we be denying um, this presence of heathlands. And it's, it's intrigued me because very intelligent people just seem to say it doesn't happen. And I think I've talked about our European dominated ecological paradigms. You know, we still, you know, at school until recently, we still learned European history. You don't know what the Chinese did. We don't know. And just recently I see that there's, I think in today I saw on Facebook that there's a um, 2,500 year old um, Iron Age site that's just been discovered in Woodenham in, in KZN. Um, you know, people have done a lot more to this planet than we give them credit for, I think. And so it's also, I think, our, is it our ignorance or is it just our persistent rejection of the peer-reviewed literature? And uh, to me, the peer-reviewed literature hasn't been um, entirely read and understood. And of course, the, the real problem for us in the Cape is that there's this coincidental, coincidental co-occurrence of the Cape Floristic region in a Mediterranean climate zone. Um, however, if you think about it, it much, there's much famous in the vicinity of Wakanda, which is the old Ramstown, clearly demonstrating that the Cape Floristic region is not climatically constrained, as Wakanda 
is in the southern is in the summer rainfall area. Um, but we still talk um, a la many people as MTEs. We have an MTE Mediterranean terrestrial ecosystem. And then our continual use of a biome as a basic reference point. So I'm not, I think a biome um, concept is really very good, but I think it also comes with problems. I mean, the biome concept was something that Clements evolved in the early 1900s with a very Eurocentric ecological view. He also had the whole climate, climate climax concept, which has been, has been challenged quite um, a lot nowadays. And he defined biomes as the largest basic unit of a biological community encompassing the flora and fauna. Uh, only later were the abiotic components added. Um, so um, that was climate and soils, but nowhere are plant available nutrients part of that definition. And I think that's, that's a, a basic flaw in it. Um, and so let me go, and then the last of the Falklands, which is just a, a fun thing. Let me go to the biomes. You can see, this is Messina and Rutherford's biome map. And you can see at the bottom, if you go the Fainbos Cape Floristic region plus subtropical thicket, that in purple, I think I can see it almost purple. And in the greater Cape Floristic region is the Cape, is the succulent, you add the succulent Peru to that, and you can see that's the greater Cape Floristic region. So this basically, this is basically the more or less the winter rainfall. And this ends at Port Elizabeth or Kabecha. Um, that's all year rainfall. That's very similar to Sydney in actual fact. So this is the greater Cape Floristic region. And it's largely there because of the, the geology. Now, um, I don't have a geological map, but I did talk about the Falklands. Um, back in the way before when Gondwana was still reasonably intact, there from the fork from Kabecha, um, come on, my, my thing keeps moving around, sorry. Um, from Kabecha anyway to Port St. John's, um, that chunk of land there, there was a lot of Table Mountain sandstone quartzites and, um, and quartzites from the Cape supergroup as well. I mean, the Natal group as well, which end up somewhere north, somewhere up to Richards Bay, somewhere here. There was once a continuous band of the same geology all the way down and right the way up to Nevadville. But this chunk of country here became the Falk, sloughed off and went, and that's the Falkland Islands. So the Falklands really belong to us, not to the Argentine or to the Brits. They're really ours. They're part of the African plate, if you like. And that connection, losing that connection meant that the migration of species up and down through those nutrient poor soils that would have been available was lost. And that, that might account for a lot of the, lot of the holes that we see in, in our understanding. So that is it. Uh, the, the Cape Sud route and our quartzite. So you can read that at your leisure when you see it again. So two conclusions, because I think my time must be running out. So by recognizing um, our famous as a specific type of heath that allows us to align this locally unique vegetation type globally. Famous is a locally unique vegetation type. But to, if we can align it globally to global heathlands, to me, it elevates its, its conservation significance. It doesn't diminish it, it elevates it. And we, maybe we can then understand it better because there are lots of plants in the, in the heathlands which cannot grow and, and would be outcompeted. And one thing I failed to mention is that Ray Specht back in the 1950s when he was doing his PhD at Dark Island Heath out of Adelaide, he fertilized the heathland um, community. And over a 10 year period, it got it trans it transformed into a Thermida triandra grassland. So by adding the right nutrients in the right amounts to a heathland, he turned it into a grassland. So if you go back to that gradient, um, grassland to heathland, he was able to reverse that by adding nutrients. Now that work generally is 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 ignored, and I have other examples that I can tell you about Jonker's Hook in the old days when they had fire breaks, but we won't go there for now. So. He, our Cape Fainbos or Fainbos Heathton has global biodiversity status and we should ask questions, different kind of questions about its origins and affinities, but if we consider that it's a heathland, then the questions we ask will be different. But it also allows us to recognize other local heathlands that are here where rest element is minor or even absent. 
Um, but there are many other Cape elements there. So in Ponderland, there are many, um, even the Alderi KC, um, Bruni AC, as well as Prodi AC, and some restias, maybe not in the quantities that we have them here in the Western Cape, but certainly they're there. Um, so in South Africa, heathland remains a term reserved for northern temperate vegetation largely, although we do have some, you know, there are some low ericaceous shrublands that are called heaths here, um, but, um, and, and somehow we've, 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 we haven't made that jump. So to me, if you look carefully at what Specht has, has published um, over his lifetime, is that heathlands are essentially a southern hemisphere um, vegetation type, largely, mainly in Australia with big areas in the southwestern Cape. And here in the southwestern Cape, instead of having the famous biome that we have, we should really have a Renostafeld biome and a heathland biome that, that just coincidentally co occur in the same, um, in, in the same geographical area, but not on the same um, nutrient gradient levels. Um, and those that resist using the word climate famous is different. Um, that's, that to me is something they, they nearly, really need to res reserve. I can tell you that when I was in Australia in 78, we did some field work on Stradbroke Island, which is just off the coast near Brisbane, which is about the latitude of Durban. Um, we worked in a, in a, in a, a restio dominated um, restia pacra dominated um, community. In Australia, restias generally are in, in wetter sites rather than, than here. We have restias that are well adapted to much drier sites. Um, but that in Australia, they seem to have stayed in their original habitat, um, which is wetlands. So, folks, um, I need to end here and say thank you for listening. And I hope you enjoyed it. Um, and I hope that you are, are critical of, of what I've said. And if you need to ask me any questions, um, I'm very happy to answer as many as I can right now, if that's possible. But also, you can also email me at any time you wish um, about these things and we can enter a discussion. Thank you very much for listening. Okay, John. Wow, 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 Prof. Um... That was uh, that was just great. I think you've just taken us on a biodiversity world tour. <laughs> you know, you've just touched on so many things, looking at different landscape. You've looked at Australia. You've looked at South Africa. You've compared to my goodness. Um, thank you for your passion, Prof. Um, we really, really, really appreciate it. And I think, um, you know, I think more and more we need to appreciate that. Um, the world that we know it, if we don't look after the environment, uh, it will cease to exist. Um, so yeah, so we look forward to just um, picking your brain on how do we, you know, sustain all these beautiful ecological infrastructures, natural infrastructure that you've just uh, uh, talked to us about. Uh, but before we do that, let me just take a quick question from Anonymous, uh, Anonymous attendee. Um, he says, Prof, um, how come, um, is plant available phosphorus so low when there is lots of phosphorus in the soil? Uh, for example, there are phosphate mines uh, on the West Coast. And um, so what is your view on that? Okay, that's, that's an excellent question. And thank you, Anonymous, for that question, because it's, uh, it's very pertinent. The phosphate mines on the West Coast are... are um, are they calcium phosphate? I'm not sure of the exact form that the phosphate's in, but it's in a form that is not dissolvable. It doesn't dissolve into the soil. So yes, there's high total phosphorus. Absolutely. That's not, a, that's not the issue, but it's the available phosphorus. So they're very um, plant ecophysiologists have got other ways of measuring phosphorus availability. And it's the phosphorus availability that's so critically important and anyway the vegetation in the west coast park there is probably a is probably what i call strunfelt it's not a it's not a heathland anyway um but just to take that one step further because the next question would be our our, calcia, our calcareous fanbus on the gallus bank for example if you look at the total phosphorus there it's also high but if you look in the root rhizosphere that's the very narrow little band of 
of soil that the roots can access. The mycorrhiza of the ericaceae, for example, those fungi, which are so important for many of our plants, but not for all heathland pl plants, by the way, that, that those mycorrhiza are mining that phosphorus and then giving it to the ericas. And in exchange, of course, they get carbohydrates and, and, and things that they need. So that um, symbiotic relationship is very critical. But again, even there, the total phosphorus levels are high, but it's the plant availability that's the the critical thing it's and phosphorus can be i mean we've got phosphorus in our bones it's not available to the body um, and we need atp in every cell and that's a that's another interesting story yep i hope i answered the question uh prof um yeah and and if you haven't um we will just keep punting it again and again and again prof okay. let me just ask this quick question um, what is the impact of climate change um, and how is how is the soil composition sort of adjusting itself to the, you know, to the midst of climate change that, that we're experiencing uh, globally? Okay, well, I think that's a good question too, and it's one that I certainly don't have an answer for. But I can say that, that these Heathton sites are old, going back to the Permium, I think it is. Um, so, you know, several hundred million years they've been around and they've been through all kinds of um, climate changes. Um, I personally, yes, we, with climate change, we will lose plants, but not so much in the heathland. The, the plants that are really, really going to be hit very, very hard are uh, in the succulent Karoo. Uh, and that's not a heathland. That's, a, that's another vegetation type that's not so nutrient dependent but dependent on bimodal um, rainfall amounts. So I don't know that our mountain fanbos, to call it, or mountain fanbos is the, the, the heathlands that we have. I don't think they will struggle. I'm sure some plants will struggle, but I think that they have persisted through evolutionary time and they will persist again. It's not the heathlands that are mainly at, at stake here. It's, it'll be the plants that are the non-heath. And that, that also, has confused, I think, the view of some of the people who are talking about loss of plant diversity in, in with global climate change. Just my view. Sure. No, definitely something um, uh, to definitely look into. Um, you know, because you you often you often look at the landscape, especially in the mountain areas, and you ask yourself, you know, um, when there is just so much uh, climate change happening elsewhere. How is that? How is that uh, affecting? So definitely something to look into. Uh, we've got another question here, Prof. Uh, that says, "Are there any um, varieties of fanbos that provide good uh, forage for bees uh, and uh, these better sources uh, sources soil dependent?" I hope I'm reading that correctly. Yeah, yeah? I, I, I think that many fanbos plants provide some um, food for bees. Um, and, and certainly um, when they flower, the proteas, for example, they, there's quite a big nectar and you see, nectar's cheap to make, it's just carbohydrates. It's just carbon dioxide, hydrogen and water and it's photosynthesis. So what I call CHO, those are, those are cheap products. The expensive products are the ones that contain nitrogen, phosphorus and those macro um, elements that, that plants need. So. I think that we can get a good a, a good nectar flow through some heathland plants, um, but how high the protein is in terms of in terms of their um, the pollen and so on. I think generally there are no mega herbivores in the heathlands. Um, if you if you if you pardon me saying that, um, but it's true the the mega herbivores that have, and many have gone extinct were all in the lowlands and they were in the more nutrient rich sites. Um, elephants at Oliphant's Boss, it's called that because an elephant, that poor elephant wandered down there and starved to death, I reckon, um, because there, there are no nutrients. I mean, I worry and, and, I, and I hesitate to bring up the baboon story in Cape Town, but the baboons have been pushed to the mountains. That's not their preferred habitat. They want to be in the lowlands. Um, and, and that's why they will keep pushing into the lowlands where people live and, be, and are that kind of a problem because they are hungry, they're starving in the, in the heathlands because heathlands don't have high nutrient productivity. You, you know, the old herders, they didn't herd their livestock because um, 
1500 or so years ago, there were cattle and sheep in the Western Cape or sheep goats. We think they were sheep now. Um, and they were on the lowlands. So the old San um, herders or Khoisan people, they herded on the lowlands. They went to the mountains for their souls and to paint, um, not to go and eat, I don't believe, anyway. Sure. Prof, um, I got to tell you, this is, um, yeah, some interesting stuff you, you're sharing with us. Wendy says, um, how does invasion uh, by alien plant uh, species affect soil availability phosphorus? Um, what are the implications for restoration uh, post-clearing of this invasive species? Well, I, th I think that's been looked at quite effectively um, by some people, and, and not all that research is necessarily um, available or, or, or people follow it. Um, certainly the Australian acacias that are invasive on the lowlands, not necessarily in the Fainbos sites, again, not in the heathland sites, they tend to be off the heathland sites. Um, the only exception to that rule is black wattle, and let's talk about that maybe separately. But if you look at the, the Australian acacias that have phyllodes or broad, broad leaves that are the PTLs that are, they tend to be in the more nutrient rich sites and they certainly elevate the nitrogen in those sites and, and that's a problem. And so I think William Bond and some students once said that the thing to do when you've cleared Port Jackson or in the lowlands is to plant a, 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 a quick growing grass crop that you can burn and so burn the nutrients off and, and somehow you've got to reduce those nutrients to allow the natural vegetation to come back. Because as soon as you have in elevated nutrients, non fainbos plants, non heathland plants, and non restia, I mean non um, renostafel plants, they they become more aggressive and they're able to outcompete. I think there's a lot of this. I once had an argument with a horticulturist from Kirstmarsh about saying, "Well, if I fertilize my pots with ericas, they grow really well." I said, "Yes, but put that erica in the in the natural environment." And then the other things will come and steal those nutrients and outcompete that Erica. It's not the same when you have a, a, a contained specimen. When, you, when you're out there facing all the competitors, then it's a different story. And I think that that tends to be forgotten, that competition is fierce um, in natural systems. I hope I answered the question. If not, send it back to me. Ah, don't worry, Prof. Um, we got you on lockdown. Eh? We've got your email address. We've got your social media networks. We're going to be just on top of you. <laughs> All right. Fine. Let me take this um, uh, last two questions, Prof. Um, uh, Marty asking a very important question, which um, I'm particularly interested in as well. Um, and the question goes, will invasive species possibly displace fain boss? What's your thoughts uh, on that, Prof? Well, you see, I, I think Port Jackson, and I see it's Port Jackson there. Um, yes, Port Jackson is really a, it's it's really a it's really a Strandfeld species rather than a heathland species. Um, yes, it does it does creep into those heathland sites that are you know, the problem in the in the in the Western Cape is that we have steep environmental gradients, not just in elevation but also in soil. So often we have this very tight inter interdigitation between heath and non heath, and that's complicates the separation as well to some extent. So um, mm -hmm. they are a problem, absolutely. Um, but they're more a problem on, on the sort of um, aeolian sands that are a bit more calcium rich and they seem to be able to access because they've got not very aggressive nit nitrogen nodules. Um, well, they're not aggressive, but they're very effective. And you've got to remember that, that these Australian acacias evolved in Australia where nutrients are even less available. So when they come here, they suddenly see, oh, this is a much richer place. You know, I've moved from Kailicha to Kirstenhof. Now I've got more nutrients, there's more, there's more stuff. So people in Kailicha are poor, people in, in Kirstenhof are a bit richer. In Constantia, they're richer still. So if you look at it at, at, in monetary terms as nutrients, you can see that, that these plants are, because they're more effective in, because they evolved under low nutrient conditions where they have slightly more, they then be, can become more aggressive and none of their predators have come with them. So there's this, this whole thing about predator release. It's, it's, it's complicated and it's, you know, I don't see, when, when I see alien plants generally around South Africa, um, I see them in growing really well in areas where we have heavily disturbed the situation. 
where we have strong natural vegetation that's still intact, aliens have difficulty in invading. Um, the invasion is really a factor of our misuse, our disturbance of the systems. And so we have to then be aggressive to take them out. And that is, takes energy. Energy is money. So it can be done with care. Sure. Prof, let me just take last two. Um, yeah, you know, um, you know, as you continue with this amazing discussion and they're very thought provoking. Um, Claude is asking us a question, says, how do uh, geophyte, the uh, geophytes, right? I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly, yeah. Prof, uh, fit, uh, fit into the heathlands? Very interesting question. In, in actual fact, um, um, yeah, I, if you look very carefully, I think that Carling and company wrote a very interesting paper, and I can find that somewhere on geophytes. Geophytes are, are actually rare in the heathlands. They really reach their maximum development in the Rhinosterfeld and the Strandfeld. Um, and, and people say, oh, that's not true. You know, there are all these dices and things, but they're in little, they're in little niche sites. They're in wetlands or rock crevices. Um, we know that the Watsonias are on that ecotone between nutrient rich and nutrient poor. And the deacons did work 40, 50 years ago saying how early people who fired the vegetation farmed the geophyte corms because they have a high um, starch content. But they're on that transition zone between heathlands and non heathlands. So if you look critically at where plants grow in heathland sites, um, you know, we, we tend to think, and I'm, I'm trying to think, Ozera, let's say Ozera paniculata, I think it is, um, that, that, that shrub that used to be a, in Heria. If you look at where it grows, it only grows in rocky outcrops in the heathlands. And those rocky outcrops, if you go and look at the, the roots, where the roots are, they have access to more nutrients and more water. Um, so the critical thing is that we, we tend to generalize rather than, than look specifically. We don't have, if you pardon me, I, mean, I don't believe we have properly trained field botanists anymore. Um, people live in ivory towers and do their work in their little tower, and there's not a lot of cross pollination. And I think that's a that's a sad day because we need to understand the integration. Uh, maybe AI will help. I don't know. Um, I have some hope anyway. Definitely, uh, speaking of um, artificial intelligence, um, uh, we need to just uh, uh, say, Prof, you did very well with technology. Um, you managed it quite well. Um, like you said in the beginning stages, you said, oh, you haven't done really much of this, but you handle this like a pro. You, you're a natural at this stuff. Eh? You should do more of this uh, webinars, actually. Prof, um, uh, before we wrap it up, um, I just want you to give us a take home message, uh, particularly, you know, in the realm of sustainability. How do we move forward with all this wonderful knowledge that you've given us? And what do we do as individuals? Um, you know, to contribute positively to, you know, safeguarding of, of, of the natural habitat as we see it, as you've explained it to us uh, today. Well, firstly, I think, you know, don't, don't just, don't just um, forget about the past literature. Um, I recently reread Bue's um, Plant Forms, um, written 100 years ago or more, and, and he battled with this Heathland. I could see now, now in hindsight, it was, it was a set work book in my honors year, 1962 at Maritzburg. And um, I battled to understand what the hell he was trying to talk about. Now, many years later, and with greater understanding, I can see that, that Buse, who came from the Northern Hemisphere, was a European, he wasn't used, but he did a lot of interesting stuff. And not only Buse, but people like Smuts and Phillips and some of those original white guys largely who looked at, um, at I looked at South African vegetation. Um, they 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 misunderstood certain things because of their Western um, paradigm. So think African number one. I think we've got to start thinking African. We've got to Africanize ecology absolutely, and we've got to question um, Western type legislation about conservation because it's not working globally. Um, we have to read critically some of the literature and not just discard it because it doesn't suit our purpose. Um, and and in, in general, if you look at the ecologists in South Africa in general, many of them are white. Um, we need to grow indigenous knowledge 
about management of vegetation and that it's beginning to happen i think globally now the views of first world people in managing systems is becoming recognized that 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 the colonizers have have changed the way in which the landscapes were managed by the previous um, people who lived there um, and we have a long history of different kinds of people living in the southwestern Cape. and uh, you know, there's a good reason why these Xhosa people stopped at the Kai River because that's where the C4 grasses stopped. They couldn't they, they couldn't grow their crops south of the Kai and then coming west because there was the, the C4 crops that they were growing sorghum and millet and, and pearl millet and so on wouldn't grow. So um, we've we've got to take into account our, our broad ecology, try and understand it better, um, and 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 discuss it. You know, not just write old farts like me off, you know, as, as irrelevant. Um, but that, be that as it may, um, I don't know where we'll go, but it's, it's fun. And as I've got older, I've become more militant maybe about my views because it frustrates me that people that I've actually taught um, 40 years ago and perhaps taught, must have taught badly, but they don't understand what I now understand. So I, I've kind of, I think I've learned in my journey through life and, and others have stagnated with their journey. They're not really learning very much. So that concerns me. So yes, let's open our minds. Let's accept um, other views that, that are, but views on fire, for example, and nutrients. We need to understand what's happening to the nutrients. That we start with the geology and the soils and build up from there. And I think that that understanding would help us even with water conservation, perhaps. And guys. Wow. Prof, um, yeah, think African, um, improving uh, indigenous knowledge systems. Um, I think, Prof, you've just said a mouthful there, and I think that calls for another book. <laughs> no, I'm not going to write another book. Thank you. <laughs> offer, but no. Believe me, I'm finished. Yeah. Prof, um, you know what? The young men like yourselves that are still so energetic, we really need to hone them down and really, you know, get as much as you possibly can. So, um, uh, we def we definitely go into look into that. But Prof, uh, that was just absolutely amazing. Thank you so much for for sharing your passion. Uh, you know, like we always say uh, in this platform, that when you do what you love and you have passion for it, um, it's almost like never working a day in your life, uh, but you know, Correct. still being good for it. Yeah. So yeah, thank you. Your passion um, is an absolute, you know, pleasure for all of us. You, you empower us with this uh, knowledge that you've just shared. And I think there's just, um, you know, the one key thing is that there's just still so much more to learn. Um, and let's end it off here, ladies and gentlemen, and say, what's that tree? Now, if you want to get yourself, um, get your hands on this copy, uh, please go and visit the www.kistenboschbookshop.co.za. Um, make sure that you make an order through Straight Nature. Check our social media pages, like, 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 like the Kistenbosch page, as well as Straight Nature, as well as um, our friends from Room to Grow. Um, get yourself this book. I think, um, you know, the weather's cleared up nicely. Uh, let's check out the trees and let's go out there and explore uh, what this beautiful nature has to offer for all of us. Now, ladies and gentlemen, without any waste of time, Prof, it's been an absolute pleasure. Let me also take um, this opportunity to thank uh, all our team that are working behind the scenes, Belinda um, and the team back at Strake, um, Kathy Abbott, you know, you know, for always going out of your way, finding this amazing, amazing speakers uh, just to come and share wisdom with us. Uh, thank you, thank you. And thanks, most importantly, to everybody that's joined us on this call. Without you guys, this talks would not be possible. We have three more talks um, lined up, and we're planning to end off with a big, uh, big celebration. We're going to be chasing uh, with our glasses of wine. Uh, Prof, please make sure to prepare that gin and tonic. <laughs> For the last talk, we're just going to have a celebratory, uh, you know, just to celebrate uh, the journey that we've taken on our we online webinars. Um, we'll be doing some giveaways as well. Uh, I don't know if I should say that. Maybe the team will say, John, stop, stop, stop. Uh, but we plan to do some giveaways uh, in that last talk. So please um, get yourself up. The next talk is on the 10th of November and we will see you guys there. Prof, last words from you in 15 seconds. What do you say to the people? Thanks very much, everyone. Uh, yeah, whatever. <laughs>
contact me if you disagree or agree or whatever. I'm happy to email chat. Go well. Awesome, awesome stuff. Prof, you couldn't have said it okay. best. Um, so everybody remember to vaccinate. We've got elections coming up on the 1st of November. Uh, so get yourself up for that. Let's go out in numbers. Let's just enjoy and most importantly, get yourself a book and then let's go and explore this beautiful nature. From my side, John, uh, and from the team that we work with, thank you everybody. See you guys next time. Mwah, 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 mwah. Have a great weekend. Cheers, Cheers, bro. Cheers, everyone. Cheers, John. Sharp, sharp. Thank you. Thank you. Sharp, yeah. Sharp, sharp. No. Oh. Off. <laughs>